the scripture portion for today's meditation is taken from the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 14 verses 25 to 34. Discipleship. Luke chapter 14 verses 25 to 34. I'm reading from the King James Version. And there went great multitudes with him and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters a and his own life also he cannot be my disciple and whosoever that not hear bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it all that behold it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20000 or else while the other is at a great way off he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace so likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath he cannot be my disciple salt is good but it, if the salt has lost its savor wherewith shall it be seasoned Here ends the reading. May God is God add His blessing to the reading and meditation of His Word. 1983, I became a follower of Christ right here in church. So thrilled that it was here my life changed dramatically. October 1st, 1983, while I sat at the corner of this church, and what happened immediately was not even less than a month. I think it must have been less than a month. I was walking down and we were all young guys at that time I was about 25 so we walk we usually hung around the back portion of this church there under the trees and I was standing under the tree of course now became a believer um really love Jesus but I had no clue how to live as a disciple and so less than a month later a bike a uh, guy in a motorbike came in and he stopped right there I remember he stopped there and he asked many people can i meet paul moses so i think a few of the younger guys pointed to me and said here is paul moses so he came up to me this guy was a football player bennett will know john prabaker he came up he was working in the central excise he was a christian by then he probably was about 26 27 two years older than me he walked up to me and said are you paul moses he said yes i am paul moses he said are you the cricket player he said yes i am He said have you become a follower of Jesus Christ I said yes I have and I asked him how did he know and then the story went on but he, for the next 5 years John Prabhaka trailed me John Prabhaka would never leave me he took my phone number he would come to my office in Kempla Sanmar Cathedral Road he would come and meet me there and then he would come and meet me invite me for prayer we would we used to go i don't know when if you remember we used to go to george moses house george and helen moses house right here near that mortsham theater and we had a scooter and from cathedral road he would say come to zion church because he was he was in zion church in chindadri pad he said come to zion church you have 45 minutes lunch time it will take you 15 minutes to ride your scooter on beach road and come there 15 minutes back we have 10 minutes come to the parsonage come to the altar we will kneel down and pray and i did that many times and after some time i told him i can't do this this is too much i've got i'm driving no lunch time he said okay come to cathedral let's go to the altar and pray lunch time brilliant man he was a disciple maker constantly with him as i look back at my life and i said thank you john for investing in my life thank you for taking the pains same with ashok vedan i come he took pains to walk with me in those initial years of my faith and i wasn't a strong it wasn't strong faith i loved god but i didn't know how to live life and these two people tracked me these two people were with me and helped me to navigate through life and that's what we're going to talk this morning discipleship 
Sometimes we have a very different understanding of what this word means, discipleship. Today in the corporate world, there is the system of buddy, you know that, or a mentor who will walk with you, who will teach you, orient you. That's the system of the corporate world. But in the Christian world, you have many examples in the Bible of people who disciple. Readily come to mind is Moses and Joshua. Joshua watched this man Moses all the time. How he was a holy man. How he loved the Lord. And how he led the people of Israel. Joshua watched until he took over as the leader of Israel. Oh, it just means preach the gospel. No, it definitely means make disciples of all nations. Walk with people. Help people. That's what God was looking at. God is looking from us. And so we go to, uh, you know, there is a difference between a follower and disciple of Christ. I know I'm making a theologically controversial statement, but let me make it. There is a difference between a follower of Christ and a disciple of Christ. Whatever way you want to make your application. There is a difference between a spectator and a player. There is a difference between a civilian and a soldier. There is. There is a difference between a follower and a disciple of Christ. What is this disciple? So hopefully in the next 15-20 minutes we will dig into it. And see where we get on this one. So here is Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 14 verses 25. If you have your Bible just keep it open. Because it's very unlike me. Every one of them is going to the Bible verse. And we will speak from here. Luke chapter 15 and verse 14. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them. We love multitudes. Isn't it? The church is long on membership. And short on discipleship. The church is long on crowds, very short on discipleship. Not this church, the whole church worldwide. We love crowds. We love people to come to our, to our meetings. We love people to come to services. We like people to come, crowds to come. But here is Jesus as he looks at the crowd. He looks at them and says, I don't need a crowd. I want disciples. He looks at the crowd and he's not, he's not going to encourage them. What would we do if we see crowds? Make sure you keep the crowd. And here is Jesus. Great multitudes were with them. And he turned and he said to them. Verse 26. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and his own life also he cannot be my disciple. How many times we have diluted those words. Those words are in red in my Bible. The words of Jesus Christ. And we have diluted that many times. Did he really mean it? We debate it. No one. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother. Wife and children. Brothers, sisters. Yes, his own life. He cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus really saying? He says, you cannot love anybody more than you love me. You cannot love anybody more than you love me. Even if it's your father. Even if it's your mother. Even if it's your precious children who are the apple of your eye. You cannot value them more than me. I am your priority. Is it tough teaching? Yes. He looked at the crowds and he said, crowds, I see you. I see that you have very good intentions. But I know one thing. If I tell you that you must hate your father and mother and children, everybody, you will go away. I know that, but that's fine. I want those kind of people. I want those people to follow me. I don't want the crowds who are part-time disciples. I don't want them. I want full-time disciples. Not in the sense of full-time that we talked about. I want these people. The people that want to follow me must be fully on with me. Don't be divided. Don't be divided. Did Jesus really say you must hate your father and mother? You can interpret it anyway. But you can say that he said, love me more. Nobody can replace me. Love me more than everybody else. Hard teaching, isn't it? That's why many people left Jesus. Not many people followed him. A few followed him. They were the disciples that followed Jesus. And then in verse 27, whoever, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, Cannot be my disciple. What was he saying? He looked at the crowd and he said, In a few weeks, I will go up that hill. In a few weeks, I will be crucified. In a few weeks, I will go through some of the most tragic moments of life. Are you willing to come with me to the cross? 
Are you willing to follow me? Because I will go to the cross in a few weeks. How many of us, how many of us will be willing to follow Jesus? Because even if he's going to the cross, will we be willing to follow him? And so he said, as he bribed, take up the cross and follow me. What is Jesus really saying? Are you willing to crucify your personal interests? Are you willing to crucify your personal desires and ambitions and goals that you have for yourself? All your lustful desires. Are you willing to crucify and take up that cross and follow me? Many of us may not follow him. Whoever does not bear his cross and come to me will not follow me. So we look at the cost of discipleship now. Then we look at the values of discipleship. And finally, what is the heart of a disciple maker? Let's see if we can do it in the time that we have. And then he goes on to say, verse 28, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down to first count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Beautiful, he says, isn't it? Lest after he has laid the foundation is not able to finish it, whoever sees him will mock him, saying, This man began to build but not able to finish. Many of us like that, our intentions are brilliant. We want to serve the Lord. We want to be a disciple all in. We want to be. But as you are away from God, because the cost is less. And here is Jesus saying to his disciples, to the crowds, and he's saying, count the cost. If you want to follow me, all in. There will be persecution. There will be challenges. There will be ridicule. That people will misunderstand you. People will bash you. People will say all kinds of things against you. Are you willing to follow me to be a disciple of Christ? Don't be part-time disciples. Be full-time disciples. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say in verse 31, Or what king going to war, make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to do it. I believe that the Ukrainian president has counted his cost. All in. Everybody in Ukraine, this is a war we will fight to the end. This is where we are. We're not going to give up. Easy for him to give up because half of Ukraine is gone. But he would say, this is it. We are all in. And that's the picture of a disciple of Christ. We are all in. We may face the biggest challenges of life, war on every side. But we are here. And ask yourself the question this morning. What kind of a disciple are you? What kind of a disciple am I? Am I all in? Am I willing to give everything and surrender everything to gifts? Or I'm keeping parts of my life, parts of my desire, parts of my ambition for myself. Let me work out life myself. And then in verse 33, he says, So likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Forsake all tough words, isn't it? This is Bible. Red letters, the life of Christ and the words of Christ. Whoever does not give up everything that he has cannot be my disciple. You can interpret it in many ways. He's talking about wealth. He's talking about your desires, about your positions, about your business, about everything that he's talking about. Unless you can give everything to Christ and surrender it to him, you cannot be my disciple. And I pray that as we look at these words, that God will speak to us. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt has loses its flavor, how can it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who, who has ears, let him hear. What is he saying? He looks at the people at the crowds and he says, do you see, do you know salt? Salt is good. Salt is salty. It's nice. But you people follow me. If you have lost your saltiness, you are no use to me. If you are not the full disciples, if you are not the all in disciples, if you are not, you are like the salt that lost its saltiness, you are no use to me and the kingdom of God. Pretty strong words. And I think as we think about discipleship, we must think long and hard at discipleship and say, what kind of a disciple am I? What kind of a disciple am I? Salt, if it loses its saltiness, it's no use. So we looked at the cost of discipleship. Let's look at, let's look at Matthew. You all know this very well, but I want to definitely touch on this because it's very, very important. What are the values of a disciple maker? Matthew chapter 5, and let's go as quick as we can. Uh, into this few things that God has to say to us. Matthew chapter 5. We know the Beatitudes. So what are the values of a disciple? What are the values of a disciple? Here it is. Jesus is talking to his disciples. His first sermon. Remember this is the first message that he's talking to the disciples. And he's got a group of people sitting with him. 
and he has to teach them the foundational values of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he looks at them and says, this is what will define your life. And disciples, followers, please listen to me. This is how we must live our life. If we live anything lesser than the standards that I talk about now, we are missing the mark. And here he goes in verse chapter 5, Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit. Verse, five, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Do you know what it means to be poor in spirit? And he's telling his disciples, blessed are those who don't think too proud about themselves and about their spirituality. You cannot for a moment be like the Pharisees. You cannot say that you are super spiritual. You are better than anybody else. No, that's not how you live as a disciple. You must say to yourself, I'm spiritually undone. I live in a broken world, in a fallen world. Unless Christ lives within me, I cannot handle this life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There are so many people in our Christian world today walking about as the superheroes of Christianity. And that's what Jesus told them. The Pharisees do this. They think that they are super spiritual. But my dear disciples, I want you to say, I want to say to you, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who do not think that they are superheroes, spiritually they are not superheroes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And the beautiful example is at the temple when the Pharisee comes and says, I give my tithes, I do everything, I do everything. And there was this man who was a poor sinner who sat there and said, Lord, I'm undone. I'm a worthless sinner. Please forgive me. And Jesus looked at that man and said, that man went home justified. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Are we spiritually proud? There's many people that are spiritually proud. Many, many, many people spiritually proud. And today God says to us, if you want to be a disciple of Christ, blessed are the poor in spirit. Secondly, which verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. We won't go into too many details. What God is saying is, disciples, unless you can mourn for the sinfulness of your life, unless you can not, it's not going and sitting in somebody's death house and mourning. That's not the mourning I'm talking about. He says, blessed are those who mourn for the deep sinfulness of their lives. They will be comforted. They will be comforted. Don't be too proud. Don't be too proud about your spirituality. Blessed are those who forgive, who mourn for their wickedness, for their sinfulness. Chapter 5, verse 5, blessed are the meek, beautiful. And he says, this is what he's teaching his old disciples. And he's saying, blessed are the meek. What is he saying? Blessed are the most talented people in the world. Blessed are the most gifted people. Blessed are the most precious people in the world. But they, even though they are strong, even though they are brilliant, they choose to be meek. They choose to be humble. They choose to be lowly. They choose to be like that. And he, the greatest example he thought, there was never a man who was as meek as Moses. He was the leader of Israel. He stood face to face with Pharaoh and spoke with him. He saw, saw God and he spoke with him. And yet the Bible says he was the most meek man, the most powerful man. And yet he was the most meek man. And I think as we reflect and look at our own lives, are we meek? Or are we proud about ourselves? Humility is a great value that Jesus spoke often, often in his teachings. And this morning we have to ask ourselves, how proud I am. How many people are so proud in this world? We cannot be my disciples. You cannot be disciple of Christ if we are proud. Let's move quickly. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. What Jesus was saying, disciples, hey. If you want to hunger after something, if you want to deeply desire something, deeply desire righteousness, deeply desire holiness, deeply desire a closeness to God. That's what I want you. You will be blessed. When you search for righteousness, when you search for holiness, this is the foundation disciples. As you listen to me, listen, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that moan, blessed are you who are very humble in life. And then he goes on verse 7, blessed are the merciful. These are the values of a disciple maker. And it makes sense because even in our own church, we need this. We know the Bible well. We know our spirituality really well. But what we don't know is how to apply it. Our problem is application. And it is true within the four walls of our own church, we have a problem in application. 
Blessed are the merciful. What is he saying? Blessed are those who forgive easily. Hey, it's so difficult. I was sitting in our own church. Let me be very frank with this. I was sitting in a very important meeting in our own church. About 70, 80 people of leaders in our church. Many years ago, sat in our church in the mini hall we were sitting. And there was a training program going on. And we came to this point of mercy of forgiving people. One key leader stood up and said, I can never forgive that guy in our church. I cannot forgive all my life. So I was the first time in a meeting and I was shocked and I looked at him and said, what do you mean you cannot forgive? He said, no, I cannot because this man hurt me so deeply. Are you saying that all your life you cannot forgive him? He said, yes, exactly what I'm saying. Are you leader in EMC? Yes, I am. Man, you look at that and you say, that's not what God wants you to be. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the people who forgive easily. And that's what he told his disciples. You want to be a full-time all-in disciple. You've got to forgive people. And how many times? 70 times. 7 in a day. 500 times if you have to forgive people. You must forgive people. Otherwise you're useless. I don't want you. That's what Jesus was saying. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those whose motives are pure. Whose sexuality is pure. Who don't have any wrong things within them. They are clean in their minds, in their thinking, in their everything. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Verse 9, and he's talking values to his disciples. Blessed are the peacemakers. Hey, how much we need peacemakers within the church. Isn't it? There are two kinds of people. One group of people carry two buckets of petrol. And there's the other group of people who carry two buckets of water or sand with them. Whenever there is a crisis or a conflict, there's a group of people who will pour two buckets of petrol over it and make it burn bigger. Then there is a group of people who have two buckets of sand. Whenever they see a fire, they will go first to rush in and put out the fire. Blessed are the peacemakers. What kind of a person are we? We want to call ourselves disciples of Christ this morning. God is speaking to us. Forget about me. This is the word of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For this is the kingdom of God. You will be called a fool for following Jesus. You will be disrespected because you follow Christ. You will be ridiculed. You will be misunderstood. You will, do, you will be slapped. You will be hit. You will do all kinds of things. People will talk behind you. People will stab you in the back. All that. Are you willing to follow me? Blessed are you who are persecuted. We've done well to finish two sections. The last section is 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Now this is the heart of the disciple maker. So we saw, we saw first, we saw the cost of discipleship. And secondly, we saw the, the values of a disciple. Now we come to what is the most practical part of it. Are you a disciple maker? Are you somebody like John Prabhakar? Are you somebody like Ashok Vedanayagam who chased after people and discipled them so that they will become brilliant in the kingdom of God? I see in our church, I see so many people who live, who are below the 45 year bracket, walking around the campuses, walking around them. Who has taken responsibility? Who of the senior generation has taken responsibility for five people? Who has taken responsibility for 10 people and have prayed with them and have discipled them and have walked with them so that our church marching into the future has people who know how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. How many of us have done it? Because the Bible says, go into all the world and make disciples. That's why Paul took it seriously. And he writes to Timothy. If you read 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, verse 3, I'll read it for you. I thank God 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a conscience, with my conscience, as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers day and night, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. Paul's writing to Timothy, heartfelt letter, letter. This is the heart of a disciple maker. I remember you, Timothy. I cry for you. Every day I remember you. Every day I cry for you. I am mindful of the tears of you. I love you, Timothy. You are my son. You are my adopted, my beloved son. I love you. Why? Why would Paul do that? Because he was interested in the kingdom of God. He knew people like Timothy. If they were disciples, the kingdom of God would be good. 
The churches of God will be brilliant. And that's why Paul poured out his whole life into people like Timothy. And this morning that question should ring in our hearts every time. Am I? Have I? Disciple somebody. Am I a disciple maker? The second thing that Paul does, Paul says many things. Maybe we'll finish in about two, three minutes. Therefore, verse 8, he says, Paul, Timothy, I know that you're ashamed of me. Verse 8, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering. He's writing to Timothy. Timothy, as you grow in your role as a pastor of the church at Ephesus, I say this to you, never be ashamed of the gospel. Never be ashamed of the gospel. Oh, how many times we call ourselves the disciples of Christ and are ashamed of our allegiance to Christ. Never be ashamed, Timothy. And he says, and he goes on to say, don't be ashamed of me and my chains because I'm in jail because of the gospel. Never be ashamed of me. We speak about a gospel that gives life to people. No need to be ashamed, Timothy. No need to be ashamed, Timothy. He's writing his heart out. This is the heart of a disciple maker. And then in chapter 2 verse 3 verse 2 he says. And the things that I shared with you. That you have heard among many witnesses. Commit to faithful people. You must endure. Verse 4 verse 3. You must therefore endure hardships. As a good soldier of Christ. This word soldier of Christ seems to come often. Often as disciples. All the words of the Bible seem to compare disciples to soldiers of Christ. Soldiers. Are you a soldier? We could go into the explanation of a soldier who has just one focus to defend his nation. And as a disciple of Christ, that's what Paul is telling to Timothy. Timothy, you must endure hardships as a disciple, as a soldier of Christ. And then he goes on to say in chapter 2 verse 22, he's writing his heart out. He says, flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, love and peace. Flee youthful lusts. This is an older man. Remember, I remember John Prabhakar and, 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 and Ashok Vedanagam saying this to me. When you're young, you will have these youthful desires. You will have all kinds of temptations in your life. You must. I still remember a conversation. We are sitting in a small little place on a train. Going to Danish Pen and me and Benny Christian, we were talking about this. And we said, oh, this life is so challenging to face the youthful lust. How do we manage that? And we both started talking that night about this. And that's what Paul writes to him and says, don't think that because you're a pastor, you will not have youthful desires. You will be, Timothy, he says. Then he goes on in verse 24, chapter 2, he says something beautiful. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, must be gentle. Oh, how much we need it in our church. A servant of the Lord must never quarrel. This is Paul writing and this is the Bible. And yet, in our own church and in churches across the world, people quarrel. How can we be disciples of Christ if we are quarreling? That's why Paul's telling Timothy, you're a pastor. Never get into a quarrel. Never fight with somebody. That's not in the dictionary of a disciple of Christ. You cannot quarrel. And a servant of the Lord must never quarrel. We pride ourselves calling ourselves as servants of God. But forget about the quarrel. We will quarrel. Two more and we are finished. Chapter, chapter 4. And in verse 2 he says. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 he says. Timothy I want to give you two good advices now. Preach the word of God. Be ready in season, out of season, Timothy. You must be an approved worker of God. You must know your theology really well. And once you know your theology well, you must be ready to preach in season, out of season. What is he saying? When it is a good time, when you feel really good in your spirit, when everything is going well in your house. The season was because of the farming. You know, when you, when you seed, there is a season. Harvest, there is a season. But doesn't matter when you're not doing well in your life, when you have no money in your house, when there's no food on the table, when there is crisis in your life, no season. Forget about the season. Be ready in season, out of season. Be ready to preach, Timothy. Sharing his heart, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, if you cannot preach every season of your life, you cannot be a good disciple of Christ. And probably the last thing he says, Something that we can think about. Something that some people who are older can think about it. 
chapter 4 and verse 6, the last one. For I'm already, chapter 4 and verse 6. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally there is laid out for me a crown. Paul's telling him I'm poured out like a drink offering. Hey, let's ask ourselves the question. Can we honestly say as senior members of our church. Have we poured out our lives as a drink offering? Can we say that tonight, this morning? I'm done. I have run the race really well. I poured out everything that I have in my life. I poured it into Timothy, into Silas, into Barnabas, into everybody. I poured out. I've run this race really well. I fought the good fight. What does he mean by fight? He says, I've tried to keep the theology right. There were many people who came and taught wrong teachings. But I fought that fight. I made sure that Christian theology is good. Timothy, you must fight it now. I've been poured out as a drink offering. My time has come to go. I'm ready to go. But I want you to know, Timothy, and that's why, when because my time is coming to an end, I poured out everything into you. Now you run, Timothy. You know everything. And the question this morning for us to ponder, are we a good disciple maker? Are we an all-in disciple? A soldier for Christ? Or are we still part-time disciples? Amen.